right, we would like to welcome all those who are watching us on Facebook here at First Baptist Church, Charleston, Arkansas. And it's so good to see those who are here in person. And God bless you for being here tonight. Our study this week is on the sufficiency and the superiority of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. It is impossible to understand the teachings about the priesthood of Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews without first understanding Leviticus chapter 16. So tonight I invite you to take your Bible and turn with us to the third book in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, then Leviticus, and we'll begin in chapter 16, and we're going to begin in verse 29. Verse 29. Have you done a lot of study in Leviticus lately? All right, the Word of God says this. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves. If you have a translation, it may say, you must humble yourself before the Lord. Or you may have a translation that says, you must come before Him in prayer and fasting. Fasting. Fasting was not dieting. Fasting was doing without food so that you could draw close to God, spend the time that you might have spent eating, spend that time in prayer, and because this is the most important holy day of the Jewish calendar, the people would humble themselves before God, they would spend time in prayer and fasting while the priest is doing his job inside the temple. So here it says, On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves, not do any work. Not only did you not go to work, you left your hometown and you went to Jerusalem. And the whole nation gathered. And they all gathered outside God's house in the courtyards. And it says then, whether native born or alien living among you, so even the Gentiles who were living with them had to show up on the Day of Atonement. Because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. The Day of Atonement was the day when people's sins were forgiven for the year. And they had to do it every year all over again. And the next year they had to do it again. But if they didn't do it, their sins were not forgiven and they were not right with God. So he says, because on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you, then before the Lord you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of rest. You must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father's high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar and for the priest and all the people of community. So literally, you could call it not just a day of atonement, but a day of atonements, plural. Because he's going to atone for the altars. He's going to atone for the tabernacle. He's going to atone for the holy place, for the laver, for all these different parts that are used in worship. He's going to ask that they all be cleansed from sin, from the usage that was made with them with all the children of Israel and the priest for the past year. And so they're going to make atonement for those. And the priests will be atoned. And the people of the community will be atoned for. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you, 
Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. Is that a big deal? Absolutely. So the whole nation gathers. And they gather around in the courtyard outside the, the tent, the tabernacle. And on the inside of the tent, it's called the tent of meeting. And that's a place where priests would go and function. But on the Day of Atonement, not a single priest could go in the tent of meeting with one exception. The only man who could go within the tent of meeting was the high priest. Every other priest had to wait outside with the people and have their sins cleansed just like everybody else. Now, the, the great high priest, he would not only go in the tent of meeting, he would go through that tent and go to that area known as the most holy place. The holy of holies. And we're going to find that when he goes in there, he can only go inside that place one day a year. And that's on the Day of Atonement. So, here are the people, and the people are going to wait outside, and they're going to fast, and they're going to pray, and they're not going to do work, and they are going to wait with great anticipation until the high priest come, come out and tell them their sins have been forgiven. And then they're going to rejoice then they'll rejoice. All right. If you will, look at uh, chapter 16, verse 21. Verse 21. The high priest, he is to lay both hands of his head on the live goat, confess over it all the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, put them on the goat's head, he shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. Now, beside the, the high priest, there is one man who's chosen out of the nation, and this man has a special job. Once the sins have been confessed on the scapegoat, it's his job to take that goat and leave the camp with all the children of Israel and go way off far into the wilderness and he's going to abandon that goat in the wilderness where it could never find its way back. And once he's done that, he's going to come back and he's going to take off the clothing that he wore while he did this. He's going to take a bath and he's going to put on clean clothing and then he comes back to be with God's people. So that's the man who leads the scapegoat into the wilderness. But there is a second man who has a responsibility, who is chosen from the children of Israel. Look at verse 26. Here it talks about the first man, the scapegoat. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes, bathe himself with water, afterward he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offerings, whose blood was brought in the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and offal are to be burned up. That word awful means their guts, their intestines. And it says, the man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come back into the camp. So all the people are waiting. The high priest is going to do just about all the work. The only work that the high priest does not do are the jobs of the two men, one that takes the scapegoat and releases in the wilderness, and one that takes the remains from the sin offerings 
and he will burn those outside the camp. Now it's kind of interesting because when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified outside the camp. And Hebrews 13 makes a big deal out of that. And it says, we as God's children should be willing to go outside the camp and suffer a rebuke for Jesus, just like he suffered and died for us. So you might want to read Hebrews 13 and learn more about that. All right, so we know that there's the group of people waiting for the high priest to do his job. We know there are two men who are selected, and one's going to deal with the scapegoat, and one with the, the sin offerings. Now let's go back to chapter 16, verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. Whoa. When they what? Keep your hand right here. Turn with me to chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. We find in chapter 9 that the priestly ministry is anointed and begins. And the priests are Moses and Aaron. The glory of God comes down and fire of the presence of the Lord consumes the burnt offering. And they're all ready to worship. But look at chapter 10 verse 1. Aaron's sons. Aaron is the first high priest. Aaron's sons... Nadab and Abihu took their censers. A censer is like a scoop. But what you put in a censer is incense. That's why it's called a censer. For the incense that goes in it. And incense was to be placed on the altar right in front of the Holy of Holies. And it was to burn day and night without fail for generations. Every morning a priest would light it. Every evening a priest would light it. Make sure it's going. So here are these two sons of Aaron, and it says they put fire of incense in their censer. They added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. They did not obey the Lord's commands on how to come before the Lord's presence with incense. They thought, well, Dad can do this, we can do it too. We're priests just like he is. No, they weren't. They were priests, he was the high priest. And they offer strange fire before the Lord, contrary to the Lord's command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. God struck them dead inside the holy place here the tent of meeting. And Aaron has to be told by Moses, you can't grieve for your sons right now. You've just been anointed to carry out these sacrifices for God. You cannot go outside the tent right now while you have the anointing on you. You must stay here and complete your job. Everyone outside can grieve for them. All your family's, family members outside can grieve for them. But you cannot grieve for your two sons until you've carried out your ministry as priest. And he said, if you don't do that, you'll die with them. Can you imagine the anguish of heart that went through Aaron? So Aaron knows there is a right way to go in the presence of God and there's a wrong way to go in the presence of God. And what happens if a priest goes into the presence of God the wrong way? He dies. Now years and years after this, there was a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. You've probably heard of him. And Josephus said that they were so frightened by the power of the Lord that when the high priest would leave the tent of meeting 
and he would go inside the most holy place, they would tie a rope around his foot, his ankle, and they would put bells on his clothing so they could hear him walking around, and that way, if he did it the wrong way and he got struck dead and there was no clanging or tinkling of the bells, they'd know to pull him out because they couldn't go in after him. That would be a scary thing, wouldn't it? How would you like to be the high priest? We'll go back to chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die. You tell him he can't just go anytime he wants. He can only go one day a year on the day of atonement. Because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. We'll explain that a few verses down. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area. With a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for the burnt offering. This bull and this ram are for Aaron and his own personal family. Before he can make a sacrifice for the people of God, he has to make a sacrifice for himself. So the first two animals that he brings in are for himself and his family, and one is a bull and one is a ram, one is a sin offering, one is a burnt offering. We'll explain the burnt offerings a little later. Now it says this, He's to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He's to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. Now this is kind of surprising. Because God had given specific instructions on the robes that a high priest would wear. And the turban was ornate. And the vestments had all these jewels that go up one side and down the other. And the clothing was marvelous. And the shoes were special. And it was a very impressive outfit. More than anyone else in the country. More than a king would wear. Because when he represented God to the people, he was dressed majestically. But when he's going to go before God, he takes off his beautiful hat. He takes off his shoes. He takes off those vestments with all the, the jewels and the urim and the thummim and these things that are in his clothing. And he puts on very simple linen. You see, we can impress people with clothing but you never impress God with clothing. And it symbolizes how simple he is. Another sinner in need of a Savior. Another man who needs to be made right with God. And so anytime he's by himself in the holy place and in the holy of holies, he must wear the simple linen. Then it tells us this. Verse 5, From the Israelite communities to take the two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So now we're up to five animals. He's going to sacrifice 
four animals, but he has five animals. He has a bull and a ram for his own sin, for his own self, for his family, and a burnt offering for his own self and for his family. He has two goats. Both goats are for the people of the nation. They're for God's people. And then he has one ram for all the people. So two goats for himself and his family, or excuse me, two animals for himself and family, one a, a bull, one a ram, and three animals for the nation. And two of those are goats, and one of them is a ram. So he is only one inside the tent, and he's got the five animals with him. It says in verse 6, he's going to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself, his household. He hasn't done that yet. He's just going to. Then he's to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So when he takes those two goats, he's going to take them inside the tent of meeting. He casts lots over the two goats to find out which one is going to be the sin offering, and which one's going to be the scapegoat. And the Lord makes that decision. He's cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering, but the goat chosen by law as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it to the desert as a scapegoat. Now, that's kind of a summary. Now, in verse 11, we see how this thing plays out. Here's the first thing. He's got the animals there, and here's what happens first. Verse 11, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. He is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He's to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord. Now, there were two altars. There is an altar outside the tent of meeting, out in the courtyard, and it's the bronze altar, and that's the altar where the animal sacrifices are made. There is a second altar. It's much smaller, and it's right in front of the Holy of Holies, where you would go through the curtain to go into the Holy of Holies, and it is the altar of incense. So he's going to have killed his bull outside where the people sit. He takes the blood of the bull inside. He goes up to the altar of incense. He takes some coals of fire from the altar, And once he gets those coals of fire in his censer, he's going to take two big handfuls of incense and throw them on the burning coals. So what's the incense going to do? It's going to make steam. It's going to make this vapor come up. Look at this. Verse 12. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord, two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense, and take them behind the curtain. He just went in the Holy of Holies. Wow. can only go in there one day a year. If you didn't go right, what happened? You died. Is he going to do it the right way? Well, here's how he has to do it. It says, He's to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so that he will not die. He's got to throw that incense on those burning coals so enough incense makes this big cloud that it covers over the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant because if that thing is in view, if he sees it, he's going to die. There's got to be enough smoke that when he goes in there, he can't see it. Because if he can see it, he's going to die. Would you get small handfuls of incense? Or would you get big handfuls of incense? 
I don't know what he got, but I know what I'd get. <laughs> and if the Lord hadn't said only two, I would have probably got three. But I wouldn't dare get three because the Lord said two. So he's got to go inside, but he's got to have enough smoke coming out of that censer that it covers up the Ark of the Covenant where the spirit of the Shekinah glory of God dwells. Then it says this. He's to take some of the bull's blood with his finger, sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. That's the mercy seat. That's the lid to the chest of the Ark of the Covenant. And it has these two cherubim angels bending over together to touch their wings. And he's got to put blood from that bull that he sacrificed for his sins and for his family's sins. And the blood has to be placed on the mercy seat, on the lid. And so it says, He will sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. So he puts some on the east end and he puts some on the ground in front of it. In fact, he's going to have to put seven drops on the ground in front of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place. Oh, excuse me. I got down too far down. I skipped some verses. Let me go back. Verse 13. He will put the incense on fire before the Lord, smoke the incense, will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony so he will not die. He'll take some of the bull's blood with his finger, sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover, then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover, and that's for his sin and his family's sin. Once he's done that, he shall slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people. So he goes back outside and he kills the goat on the bronze altar. And he brings its blood. And he'll do with it as he did with the bull's blood. So he's got to get more coals. He's got to get two more handfuls of, of incense. Throw theirs on there. Walk into the Holy of Holies and put the blood from the goat on the side of the altar and then in front of the altar. Just like he did for his own sins, now he does it for the whole nation. First sacrifice for his own sin. Second sacrifice for the sins of the people. It says in verse 16, in this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and the rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He's to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one's to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, the whole community of Israel. So he atones for himself, his family, for the whole nation, but he also makes all the instruments, all the utensils, all the altars, all the things used in worship, he puts blood on every one of them. So they'll all be atoned. All be cleansed. It says in verse 18, Then he shall come out to the altar that's before the Lord, make atonement for him. He shall take some of the bud's, bull's blood, some of the goat's blood, and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his fingers seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring forth the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat, this is the scapegoat. And confess over it all the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins. That's very interesting. The New National Version calls it wickedness, rebellion, and sins. But the three words that are translated 
are the most common three words for sin in the Old Testament. If you asked an Old Testament Jew what sin was, he would summarize it with these three words. There is transgression. That's crossing over a boundary you should not cross. God has set up boundaries not because God is unjust, but God has set up boundaries for our lives. And if we will live inside the parameters, inside the boundaries that God wants us to live in, He'll bless our lives. But when we cross over those boundaries, sin, transgression, harms us. That's one of those three words here, transgression. Another word is the word sin. And the word sin literally means missing the mark. Trying to do what's right, but never able to reach the mark. Transgression is often done deliberately. Sometimes transgression is done not deliberately, but accidentally. But even if it's accidental, it's still transgression. But sin is when we try to do right, but even when we try to do right, we can't. But there's a third word. Here it's called rebellion, but it's usually translated iniquity. Iniquity is shaking the fist at God and saying, God, I know what you want me to do, and I'm not going to do it. It's my life. Leave me alone, God. That's iniquity. They would picture iniquity in ways that would be very similar to what we would call iniquity today. Uh, have you ever, remember the days when you had chalkboards in schools? Have you ever heard anybody just take their fingernails and start at the top of a chalkboard and just scrape their fingernails down that chalkboard? That is the sound of iniquity. That rebellious, I'm not going to do it your way, God. Now, what does he confess? He doesn't know all their sins. He doesn't know all their transgressions. He doesn't know all their iniquities. But when he prays and he makes that atonement with the blood of the goat, he can, and as the scapegoat, and he's praying with his hands on the scapegoat, and he prays for their transgressions, and he prays for their sins, and he prays for their iniquities. And that covered the A to Z of sin. So it says, verse 21. He's lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over to all the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites all their sins and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place and the man shall release it in the desert. Now let's talk a minute about these three sacrifices. The sacrifice of the bull was for the high priest himself, his family. There are ways in which Jesus Christ is like the Old Testament high priest. And there are ways where Jesus Christ is just the opposite of the Old Testament high priest. So to understand the great high priesthood of Jesus Christ, you've got to know how is he like the high priest and how is he different from the high priest. 
Here's the first difference. The high priest always had to make atonement for his own sins. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never had to ask for the Father to forgive his sin or his iniquity or his transgression. He never transgressed. He never committed iniquity. He never fell short. Amen? So Jesus is different from the Old Testament high priest. Second way that Jesus is different. The Old Testament high priest always offered a bull for himself and a goat for the people and a scapegoat. Now let's take the the first goat and the second goat. The first goat was so their sins would be forgiven. The second goat was so their sins would not only be forgiven, they would be cleansed and removed from the people. I like that. God doesn't just forgive sins, God removes sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, the high priest always had to sacrifice animals. Jesus never sacrificed animals. Jesus sacrificed himself. He laid down his life willingly. Jesus is like the first goat, and Jesus is like the second goat. So not only is he different from the high priest, he's different from the bull in a sense, but he's like the first goat, and he's like the second goat. The first goat, the blood of the goat was shed. When Jesus died on the cross, he shed his blood for us. Amen? And that's why we can be forgiven. But not only did he shed his blood on the cross, the Bible teaches also in passages like 1 Peter chapter 2, It says, he bore our sins in his own body. What did the scapegoat do? They put the sins of the people on the scapegoat, and the scapegoat took the sins away. What did Jesus do on the cross? He not only shed his blood, but on his body, our sins were placed on him, and he not only gives us forgiveness, he removes our sins from us with what he did on the cross. Jesus is both the first goat and the scapegoat. The sacrificial goat and the scapegoat. So he's different, doing a different function than the high priest of the Old Testament. They're looking forward to his greater fulfillment was something they could not do. There's no way a human could do that for us. It had to be God who became man to do that for us. All right, look at verse 23. Then Aaron's to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place. His time is done in the Holy of Holies. His time is done in the tent of meeting. It's time for him to go back out and tell the people, God has forgiven your sins. But before he can do that, he has to take off those linen garments. Verse 24, He shall bathe himself with water in a holy place and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself. Remember, he's got a ram left for himself. 
He's got a second ram for the people. And he's done the, the sin offerings. Now he does a burnt offering. Interesting thing. In burnt offerings, they burned the whole thing up. It's all consumed by fire. Look at this. It says, He shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offerings for himself and the burnt offerings for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. So he brings the fat from the sin offerings and he brings the two rams and those are entirely incinerated and the smoke goes up before the Lord. What's the purpose of a burnt offering? A burnt offering said this. When a priest offered it up for another person, for himself or for the people, he's saying this. Thank you, God, that you've forgiven my sins. I am totally committed to you. I surrender all. The burnt offering was a, I'm totally yours, God. And the scripture says that the burnt offerings were a sweet-smelling aroma that came up before the Lord. It's a beautiful offering, isn't it? Can't you imagine all the people waiting outside and the priest comes out and he says, God has accepted the sin offerings. God has put your sins on the scapegoat. Let's do the burnt offerings. And all the people said, God, we love you you with our whole heart our soul our mind God you're we love you we're wholly committed to you the man who releases the ghost scapegoat must wash his clothes and he comes back and the other man who, who burned the the leftovers from the sin offerings, he comes back and all God's people rejoice together. Now we're going to hit Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9, and 10 and you will be astounded of how much of this is in Hebrews 7, 8, and nine and ten if you don't understand Leviticus 16 you'll read Hebrews but you will not understand it does that make sense all right before we go I want you to just think for a minute do you ever wish that you lived under the old covenant not me. Not me. I am so glad to be born on this side of the cross. I am so glad that I don't have to trust some human man to make those sacrifices and wait outside while he does it. I would much rather trust the Lord Jesus Christ, wouldn't you? I have full confidence in Jesus. I have full confidence in the new covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and Jesus removes our sin away as far as the east is from the west. What a Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, we want to thank you for being here tonight, for watching tonight. And I pray that you'll let God's word speak to your heart. Brother Artie's going to come now and share a word with us.